Ian Hewitt is a research adjunct with astron our astronomy and astrophysics lab here at the museum. And he is also a JPL and NASA solar system ambassador volunteer. And so we really enjoy working with Ian for um, all of our things astronomy. So we're so glad again, Ian, that you can be here today on this Saturday morning. Well, thanks, Martha. I appreciate you guys having me in. And uh, hopefully everybody finds this interesting. I know I find it pretty interesting. This is one of my uh, fascinating topics. One of the things we study at the uh, in the Astronomy and Astrophysics Lab in uh, at, at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences is galactic structure. And uh, so we look at things outside our galaxy. And this is really related to that. Uh, this is all about the Hubble Deep Fields, uh, and I called it Galaxies Everywhere. So it's actually really a neat topic. Uh, and uh, to me, it's one of the, the more interesting topics um, you know, uh, th that Hubble has done, right? Although Hubble has done a lot of, a lot of great stuff. And uh, if you'll excuse me while I, okay, get my camera, get my uh, slides to change. Um, so, you know, uh, the whole concept, uh, you know, behind a telescope or, you know, uh, is that you want to gather more light, right? Telescopes don't really magnify. Some of them do as a byproduct, but their main purpose is you gather more light. If we look at our eyes, our eyes are very small uh, in terms of only about at most like seven millimeters wide. And as you get older, that uh, that gets a little bit smaller. So that's why younger people can see so much better in the dark and can see colors uh, when it's darker and things like that. Uh, so that doesn't gather very much light. But when you have a telescope and you have a big mirror or a big lens, it gathers a lot more light. So it lets you see fainter objects. Uh, the other way that you see uh, fainter objects is of course, if you have a digital camera, uh, whether it's on a phone or whether it's on the uh, whether you have a DSLR, you can actually open the shutter and leave it open, and gather more light, gather more photons. Because the longer that shutter is open, the more light, the more photons you gather. And so, if you have a faint object, you'll get enough photons so you can see it. And that's what people do all the time. This particular uh, picture I'm showing uh, is a long exposure uh, off the coast of Southeast North Carolina, uh, Bright Island. It's, uh, it's a, it's actually a, a nature preserve under control of Coastal Carolina University for the Marine Research Program. And, uh, uh, one of the professors at Coastal Carolina does a lot of astrophotography. And the neat thing about this is it's facing South, uh, the way the coast is shaped. So you can actually, when you, uh, and you can set up a camera and open a shutter for a long period of time, and you can actually get uh, the Milky Way. So what you're actually seeing here is uh, our galaxy is disc shape. And so it's kind of like, uh, sort of like shaped like a CD. And basically what you're seeing is when you look south, you're actually looking at, you know, the, the edge of the, the or the, the the bulk of the galaxy. In fact, you're actually looking into the center of the galaxy when you look south in the summer uh, on the beach when when this was taken. So uh, that's what that's what the Milky Way is when you see it. So, and that's uh, basically the concept we're going to talk about. It's just doing long exposures. And long exposures show you fainter things. So uh, basically, one of the cool things about science uh, and thing I like the most is that uh, you, if you have a lot of curiosity and you get some new equipment, it's, you can try some new things, right? So that's, uh, that's, always, that's always the coolest part of science, just trying something and seeing what happens, right? So uh, this is kind of what happened with the Hubble Space Telescope. So of course, everybody knows when the Hubble was first launched, there were some optical problems. Um, and uh, so there was a servicing mission uh, you know, uh, that went up to uh, correct that by putting some corrective lenses in. They actually did that in the cameras. And this is the wide field planetary camera two that had the correction. And this is the, the Hubble servicing mission one. They put the wide field planetary camera two in into to Hubble. And that basically allowed the uh, scientists to say, okay, now that we've got a really good, uh, accurate instrument, what can we do with it? What if we just you know, do a really long exposure. And uh, sorry, uh, this is, uh, and that's, this is what we call the Hubble Deep Field. And so Bob Williams, who is the Space Telescope Science Institute Director, that's the people that manage the Hubble for NASA, uh, had what he's called discretionary time, uh, director's discretionary time. So uh, of course, everybody has to do proposals uh, when you want to use the Hubble. And, you know, there's, there's, there's a, uh, there's a committee that evaluates which proposal to do at which time. It's, that still goes on. And, uh, but there's a, there was some director's discretionary time that they could give to just uh, some kind of different kind of project. So he was a big believer in doing this. So basically what he decided to do in 1994, uh, I know that 
doesn't seem like that long ago, but gee, it sure is. Uh, and uh, almost, uh, wow, almost, uh, you know, 30 years. And uh, he just, the, the idea was pretty simple, was to just take the Hubble Space Telescope and point it at a apparently blank spot in the sky. And you can kind of see over here that uh, this little uh, L-shaped area is where they were pointing and uh, point it where there were no stars or appears to be no stars and nothing there. And then just take a really long exposure and see what you get. You know, because the idea is you're gonna see what really is very faint and very far away in that area. Uh, that the area they pointed to is just uh, just up from the Big Dipper, uh, which if you get up in the morning, early in the morning and walking around, you can see the Big Dipper in our, our sky here. Uh, so this time of year. So well, that's what they did. And so what they did is uh, when I say for a long time, uh, it's not like uh, exposed for like an hour or two hours or 10 hours or 12 hours. But basically, they kept the they did exposure uh, for like six to seven days. So I mean, like a ridiculously long time. You see, taking one of the most powerful telescopes and one of the most advanced cameras and exposing it for for six or seven days, and that's just a, a an insane amount of time. Uh, so what you get is you get this image, uh, and it kind of looks a little funky because it's made up of uh, multiple images because uh, it was taken over multiple multiple orbits. Um, this is called the Hubble Deep Field. And when this first came in, I, I've heard from uh, scientists who were in the room when they image was for, for first came in and I just and they everybody just gasped because uh, they were, somebody said oh my gosh they're all galaxies and so what you see in this little blank field blanks apparently blank uh, spot in space is you see over 3,000 galaxies in this image and uh, that was just a, it was actually quite a surprise uh, in terms of the number of galaxies that were out there uh, at the time we really didn't have a, a good basis for estimating and the estimates were much, much lower. Uh, you can see that everything you see in here, uh, almost everything you see, I think there may be three stars in this image, three faint stars. And you can generally tell them because they have these spikes called diffraction spikes. Uh, but I think there's only three stars and everything else, even all these little dots, these are all galaxies. So uh, everything in there is, is a galaxy and it's it pretty amazing. So again, it looked like a a completely blank spot of sky, but there was a lot of there was a lot of things there. So uh, this was actually uh, uh, the deepest picture of the universe we had for many many years, uh, and it, it gave uh, a scientist uh, kind of a good view of some of the distant galaxies, right? Um, so what you see, of course, and it, when you look at the Hubble Deep Field, you see different types of galaxies, and and really they have three basic shapes. Um, the spiral galaxies, this is very much, uh, this is exactly the kind of galaxy we live in, uh, our Milky Way galaxy. These are the ones that kind of look like pinwheels or have the, the, the beautiful spiral arms. These are coincidentally the ones we also study at the uh, astrophysics lab at the museum. Uh, then there's elliptical galaxies. And uh, the center shows you an elliptical galaxy. And these are basically big blobs of stars. It kind of looks like, it, it's a little tricky because when you look at them, in a picture, it looks like it's uh, maybe like a bright star with a lot of gas around it, but that's only because it's very far away. It's very far away. You can't really resolve the individual stars unless you have a really powerful telescope. And um, so uh, what, all, all that what looks like gas or cloud around it, those are all just stars, lots and lots of stars. Uh, and elliptical galaxies just have different kind of orbits than spiral galaxies. Everything's just, it's all mixed up and things are kind of orbiting basically in all kinds of different different ways and different planes. So they just kind of looks like a big blob. Uh, and then the other type we see are irregular. And these galaxies, these, are look, these look like galaxies that someone kind of stirred up. Uh, and that's kind of basically what happens there because these are, most of them are results of uh, mergers or some kind of interactions with other objects that sort of rearrange the stars. Because Remember, the galaxies are made up mostly of individual stars and star systems. Uh, and so if some, something comes and rearranges them into kind of a funky shape, uh, like it collides with another galaxy or passes by another large galaxy, they tend to get stretched out. So uh, the, Hubble deep, the, the Hubble Deep Field was such a success 
that uh, we decided that, well, let's go even deeper, right? So we saw all those faint galaxies. You see a lot of those things that are like little dots. What happens if you look for even more? Right. So then the, this is the concept for the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And one thing I should probably point out is that these particular locations that we're picking out for the for the deep fields, they aren't like special locations, like galaxy heavy locations. They are just locations that look like there's really nothing there. Right. So there's there's nothing special about it. We don't believe there's any like particularly there's fewer galaxies in that area or more galaxies than any other spot. Right. So there, that's uh, that's kind of important. It's not like there's a kind of a cluster of everything in one spot. So the Hubble Deep Field is a much, much farther south than the Big Dipper. It's in the constellation Fornax, uh, which is uh, basically pretty close to our horizon. Um, if you were to try to look at it from North Carolina, uh, you probably have to go to the beach and look to the south and it'd be pretty close to the horizon. Again, nothing uh, pretty special about this location. It just seemed like a, a promising location. So uh, what we got is uh, the Hubble Deep Field. Uh, this this was taken in a series of images over three months. And where the the Hubble Deep Field, the original uh, uh, deep field is about 1 24 millionth of the sky. So that's like a really small spot. This is a little bit smaller. It's gonna be 1 26 millionth of the sky. And uh, this used some new instruments on Hubble. This uses the advanced camera for surveys. Um, and instead of it, instead of doing six to seven days, they it, this is maybe done for 12 days. It's like twice as long. Uh, that's a, well in excess of a million seconds of exposure time. So it's uh, it's quite a lot. Uh, so what we ended up with is this, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is one of my favorite images actually. Uh, and you can see there's a few stars. Again, you know by the diffraction spikes here that uh, when you see these, these spiky things, these are stars. But again, there's only about three stars in the field. I can't really find the third one right now. I guess it's at the bottom. Uh, but you again, you see tons and tons of galaxies uh, and you see all these little dots. And it's a little hard to see when you're kind of looking at it in a JPEG image like this. Uh, but if you look at it in a, a really good astronomical image program, you will find over 10,000 galaxies in this image. And that's just really amazing. Uh, so uh, this actually is what was driving us to really drive up the number of galaxies that exist in the observable universe. Because uh, just amazing the number of things that, that, that you see in this image. And you can see some really cool spirals like this one here uh, and this one here. Uh, those are two of my favorites. Uh, but then you can see a, like a lot of ellipticals. And then it's it, these are really hard to see. Things like these guys are really hard to see unless you really can zoom in. Uh, and, and try to figure out, you know, exactly their shape and everything. And there's a lot of people that spend a lot of time doing that, right? Just, you see some edge-on spirals, some spirals where they're tilted to the side, like right here. I'm pointing to the screen sometimes. I got to remember to use the pointer because sometimes I just point to the screen and I realize you can't see that. So uh, it's the, one of the hazards of virtual presentations. So uh, the other thing that, that that's important about the Hubble Ultra Deep Field is that light takes a, a finite time to travel from place to place, right? So the farther away something is, um, the longer light takes to get there. If something's, you know, like a million light years away, that's saying it takes a million years from light that ob from, uh, for the light from that object to get to us. But that also means that you are looking at that object the way it was a million years ago. So when you look deep into space, you're not only looking at far away, you're looking back in time. Uh, so that's what the Hubble is doing. When it goes, get, goes for these deep field images, you're actually starting to look way back in time. So you're not only, you're looking in history. It's kind of cool. It's like if you could take a, take a camera uh, and, and take a picture of somebody and then see their history, right? You know, like that would be really cool if you could just say, I want to do a really long exposure and see what you look like as a kid, right? That would be really neat. But uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Uh, but it does when you talk about on the scale of the universe. Uh, oops, excuse me. Sorry, it's a little fast with the scroll wheel on the mouse. So what you end up seeing is uh, you can tell in this gal in the in these deep fields, there's images of all sorts of, or galaxies of all sorts of different ages. So the farther away the way they are, 
the older they'll be. So you get the near galaxies look uh, like this, very white and blue. And then you start, they start yellowing as they get farther and farther away. And then they get redder as they get very, very far away. And that's a, kind of a general rule. Why does that happen? Why do they actually get redder? Um, they actually get source. Of course, it makes sense that they would get fainter. Uh, but why do they actually get redder? Well, uh, the reason you get these galaxy redshifts are due to the expansion of space. One thing about space, and uh, this was a big surprise when we first learned about it, you know, originally, uh, I'd say, oh, probably in the uh, 60s and the 70s, uh, we were uh, looking at the galaxy and we were trying to figure out how slow, how, how things were slowing down because everything started with the Big Bang and then space expanded out. And what happened is gravity should be slowing that expansion out. And there was a big question about whether gravity was strong enough to actually slow the expansion to bring it to a halt or actually cause the universe to eventually, billions of years from now, to collapse in on itself. And there were a lot of studies done using the Hubble Space Telescope of all things. And they looked at uh, supernovas and distant galaxies, which are a really good way to tell how far, how far away something is. And if you look at how far away things are over time. And we discovered that actually, instead of what we thought, the universe is actually expanding. Uh, and that's what we we'll call dark energy. Dark energy is actually the, the force, the unknown force that causes the universe to expand. So actually that causes space itself to expand. What that means is that if you're looking at a distant galaxy, it may emit blue light. It may be, in fact, if it's got a lot of star formation, it will be blue, right? It's gonna emit blue light. But because over time, again, the, the long periods of time for these distant galaxies, what happens is space is expanding stretching. So what it does is it stretches the light. And so what happens is the wavelength of the light gets longer, and that means the color starts changing. So it gets stretched to green, but then uh, it gets stretched out to red. So all these really distant galaxies get stretched out, so they're red. In fact, if they're really far away, they get stretched out so much they're not even in visible light anymore. They're in infrared, like near infrared. When you see comments, uh, you may see things in the uh, periodically in the press talk about a Z for distance or redshift. That's just a way to measure the stretch factor. So the larger the Z, the more the light has been stretched, which means directly, directly relates to how far away it is, right? So it's just a convenient way instead of saying, you know, uh, you know, a billion light years, it'll say like a redshift or a, a Z of two, you know, so it's just a more convenient way to refer to that. Ian, um, yeah, if this is a good time, I have a question that sort of directly relates to this. Sure. And then a few follow-up questions. Um, I'm going to go backwards, everyone, so don't worry if your question was not first. But uh, Evan asked if space goes on forever, and I think you've kind of explained that, but um, I feel like it kind of relates to what you're talking about here. So would you mind answering that? <laughs> yeah, space goes on forever. Uh, so it is, it is not – so space – yeah, space does not go on forever. It is it is finite, but it's constantly expanding, right? So the thing about it is, uh, we are only able to see about four percent ever see about four percent of the universe is our estimate. So there's still ninety six percent of the universe that basically is expanding uh, so much that we we can't get there even if we could travel the speed of light. So so it's forever in like our concept but not like forever and ever and ever just for as far as the eye can see kind of it's, it was a six-year-old who was asking yes no it's a, it's a good question yeah. it, 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 it's a good question it's really it, it, these kind of cosmology questions are, are are really tough to think about it in everyday terms <laughs> but yes it's it's not technically it's not forever but it's actually you know if you tried to travel it it would it would be forever okay that's which, a good, thank you <laughs> and then um Leah wants to know if the Hubble telescope orbits Earth, how does it stay still enough to take that six day exposure? And I, I, I know we talked about that last time. Do you answer that later? Or is this a good time to? No, it's a good time to talk about it. So that's, uh, you know, one of the tricks about designing the Hubble uh, is actually the, 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 the pointing system, right? So certainly we understand the concept of telescopes. They've been around for hundreds of years, right? Space telescopes are a little tougher, but at the same time, the basic concepts are there. They're telescopes and they have cameras, right? But the thing about it is you need to keep it pointed in the right direction. That's 
that's the real tricky part. Uh, so there is, uh, it is orbiting the Earth, and there are these little star tracker cameras. So there's additional cameras that basically will point at various stars uh, and, and, and look at how the Hubble is oriented to those various stars. And they're very precise cameras. Um, and basically, that they'll use those to determine if Hubble's moving one way or the other, right? So basically, they're going to try to keep Hubble pointed at the same spot. The way they do that is they've got something called CMGs or control moment gyros. And um, uh, basically what those do is uh, they are, think of them as, uh, they basically are uh, large metal wheels, heavy metal wheels that are spinning. Uh, and uh, if you've ever seen that physics experiment, many of you, uh, if, if you're in school, uh, they'll do the physics experiment where they, they get a, uh, they'll take a bicycle tire and they'll speed it up. And you notice that it gets kind of hard to move in one direction, um, but you know you can move it in some directions, but it's hard to move. In the, so that's the whole idea behind the, the gyroscopes, right? Is if you change the speed a little bit of those heavy wheels, it, it actually causes a little bit of reaction. So they, they also call them reaction wheels because of that. So what happens is if you, if you change the speed, like if you speed up the wheel, you're gonna get a secondary effect. It may shift a little bit. And there are, there are um, so you want a wheel in each direction. Hubble actually has five in case there's a failure, right? So basically they can change one of those wheels and just cause it to shift just a little bit. And so what they do is they watch those stars. And if, they, if Hubble is shifting out of place a little bit, they'll change the wheels. They'll speed it up or slow it down. And periodically, sometimes, uh, every once in a while, all those little adjustments kind of add up and the wheels get too fast or too slow. And so they have to take Hubble offline and they have to change the speed of the wheels to bring them back more to the middle middle piece. So that, that may be a long way to answer it, but hopefully that helps, helps you understand. It's actually a really complex system and one of the key things for Hubble. So it's a great question. Sorry, Martha, you are. Uh, yeah, muted. I was. I, I've been muting just in case my dog barks. Sorry. <laughs> um, we have two more questions. Would that be okay to ask them now, or would you? Like Absolutely, to sure. So um, we had one earlier about black holes from Marianne and Tom. Do all galaxies have black holes in the middle? I guess like we see in the movies. Yes, we believe that all galaxies have black holes in the middle. Uh, so uh, you know whether it's uh, what they call the intermediate blast, intermediate mass black holes, which are more rare, or the supermassive black holes. These aren't like stellar mass black holes. So they aren't like, you know, one size that one times the size of the sun. These have, you know, millions to billions or hundreds of thousands to billions to, uh, of uh, masses of the sun, right? So there is a supermassive black hole at the center of each galaxy. Uh, sometimes we see two if there's been a galaxy merger. We think there's been a merger and the two are kind of coming together. Uh, the one uh, the one thing that's actively being investigated is whether um, is which came first, right? <laughs> Do galaxies form prior to the black hole or were black mm -hmm. holes acted as the seeds for the galaxies? So, but yes, so all galaxies appear to have a black hole in the center. Okay. And then I'll do ask one more and then um, we'll save some of these for a little bit later too. How far does a galaxy need to be from earth to make it not even infrared light? That's what uh, Ruxin wanted to know. How far, not even infrared light. So I guess well, we wouldn't know because it'd be beyond sight, <laughs> right? Well, yes and no. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, the thing about it is that the universe is finite, right? So, and the thing is when you, uh, and the trick was what I, we just talked about here, let me roll back, uh, is that the farther you go, the farther you look, the farther back in time you're looking. The thing about the universe has a finite age, 13.7 billion years. So uh, really, they don't get out of the far infrared. Um, the primary light doesn't get out of the far infrared because there's not enough time yet. Because uh, th the Big Bang was 13.7 billion years ago. It took a little time for the galaxies to form. So uh, the thing about it is they can only be so far away. Now, over time, that will change. If you roll to a couple billion years from now, this answer would be different if you were seeing astronomy days, you know, whatever, astronomy days, year two billion. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, uh, sorry. I was going to say, um, don't worry if we didn't get your question. We'll have another question break in a little while. Yeah. So I, I love plenty of time for questions. I love getting questions. So, 
Um, so again, th when you look at the Hubble Deep Field and you start seeing these more red galaxies, these really red ones, you're starting to see back in the older universe for the most part. So, and again, why is this so important for astronomers? And I kind of alluded to this earlier. Well, um, the thing about it is it's like people. Uh, people's development's not uniform, right? So like, let's if you look way over here on the right-hand side, we've got someone who's 32 years old. If I, uh, you know, add 10 years and say, take a, a 42, 42 year old person, and I don't draw very well with a mouse, you know, sorry. Uh, you know, a 42 year old person, maybe they don't have a mustache. You know, maybe you cut your hair a little differently, but you're fundamentally a, a 32 and a 42 year old are gonna be pretty close. As you go back looking at people, you know, especially when you start looking at, you know, like three months old versus a two year old, you start noticing a lot of differences, right? Like a picture of a three month old and a two year old, oh, the pictures would look, look totally different. So the same thing apply, that works for humans, it also applies to galaxies. So uh, the development of galaxies is not uniform. So earlier on, there's a lot more going on in the early, in, in, in the early universe. And that's really what we want to try to study and try to understand how galaxies form and how, and how they evolve, right? So we can look at what's around us and that tells us some things about galaxies, but we learn a lot more by actually looking at the early times. So when you kind of look at how all this shapes up, you know, basically, uh, and again, here's, here's your red shifts. Um, so uh, again, the universe 13.7 billion years ago. Uh, so what you're seeing down here is the, the age of the universe. That's why it goes, gets smaller as you go farther to the right. You can see that uh, the ground-based observatories were able to get about 6 billion years. Uh, to with the universe was 6 billion years ago. So that's really, you know, about 7 billion years in the past. The deep field got all the way to when the universe is only one and a half billion years old. The ultra deep field right around 800 million years. So we're getting there, we're getting back to the, getting back to some pretty early times. But of course, why another deep field? Why did we do another one? Why was the ultra deep field? Well, this goes back to exactly what the question was on, Martha. Uh, it was uh, in terms of the um, uh, the infrared light. So uh, galaxies earlier than 800 million years really kind of, the most of their light or all of their light goes into the infrared light zone, right? So um, the Hubble deep field was primarily in the optical. And so what they decided to do was shoot the extreme deep field which basically adds in a lot of this infrared light. So we're trying to look for a lot of really faint galaxies. Uh, so you need near infrared images to see that. So you can kind of see up here, the range, the Hubble ultra deep field was here and the extreme deep field uh, basically covers a much, much wider range. Coincidentally, uh, we also, uh, so it took twice as long, right? <laughs> so instead of uh, about 12 days this is about 23 days of, of exposures uh, and uh, basically uh, with the uh, wide field camera three, uh, and this is the certain no one of the servicing missions with a wide field camera. So we got uh, a better infrared capability on Hubble and the extreme deep fields in the same spot, but it's only a part of the, of the ultra deep field, right? So it's just focusing on a smaller spot. Uh, when you look at it, just to give you an idea of the size for scale, I thought I would kind of throw this in for the extreme deep field. Here's uh, the moon, uh, and this is what the extreme deep field would look like compared to the size of the moon. So it's a really small spot, really small part of the sky. And this is what you get in the extreme deep field. And uh, this is actually, you see about 5,500 galaxies in here. I know it's kind of hard to tell because some of them are very little, like little tiny dots but you get about 5,500 galaxies and you get a lot of old ones. And you can kind of tell, because if you look at this image compared to the deep field, it's, it's redder and you see some really red, red galaxies uh, that, are, that are in the infrared. So just an example uh, of uh, the same fields kind of overlaid in the Hubble ultra deep field. Here's like an open spot where there was just like one little galaxy there. Uh, in the extreme deep field, you can see that all of a sudden in the center here, you're seeing a very old galaxy. 
So uh, this is actually really, really cool because you're starting to see some of these really early galaxies. That's a, it's, it, of course, it's a lot of work to study these because they are very small and uh, you don't have a lot of pixels. So that uh, takes a lot of time to kind of tease out some of these, uh, these, these ones. When you see the red galaxies in the image, though, it's not necessarily in the very early universe. That's one thing that makes it a little harder is uh, some of them may have a lot of uh, gas and dust that block off all but the red light. So you kind of have to do uh, a little bit of uh, uh, analysis of the light uh, to understand, you know, whether you've got an early galaxy or not, right? These are only about halfway. So these are about 6 billion years old, even though they look very red. These are two galaxies. This one's about 13 billion light years away. That's truly a very far and early galaxy. So uh, more galaxies, that's, a, that's the idea by doing the extreme deep field. And it's really cool. Uh, this shows this shows it all the way back to about 500 million years after the Big Bang. So that's really early times. Uh, what we're, we expected to see and what we do see as we go back in time, galaxies become fainter. Of course, they're farther away. We expect them to become fainter, but they're also a little bit smaller. And they also become rarer. And that's also what you would expect to see, right? You know, we just, did, we just didn't start with you know, the massive number of galaxies we have now, right? So uh, we're actually kind of seeing that. And you can kind of see, if you look at, this is kind of a really zoomed in, uh, this, this bottom panel is kind of a zoomed in set of images. And you can see that as you go farther, you know, when you get back to some of these really ancient galaxies, it's, it's, it's pretty hard to see, right? They're very, very faint, but you can tell they're there. And if you're lucky, you can tell a little bit about their structure. So uh, it takes uh, it takes you could actually spend an entire career studying these deep field images and learn all kinds of new things. And there are people that actually do that. So again, when you look at the the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, uh, the Extreme Deep Field, which is also called Ultra Deep Field IR, again you're getting way back into the very early universe, right? And this is actually some of the really interesting interesting times because this is when things were evolving pretty fast. And when we and it will help answer some of our questions. So um, uh, if you wanna learn more, I also have a little bit more, I wanna talk about what's coming next in deep fields. But if you wanna learn more, there's a, a, a site called Frontier Fields uh, that basically kind of gives you all the update information on these, these kind of deep field images. Uh, and then there's a, the, there's a really good site on ESA because ESA is a partner in the space the Hubble Space Telescope on the Hubble Deep Fields. And I think we have both the links that we can put in the chat and we'll put those in. Uh, so I was gonna talk about what's coming next in the James Webb, but uh, this is probably a good time if there were some more questions. Yes, sorry, took me a moment. We, um, okay, I'm gonna go back to my question document from some earlier questions. And you've answered a lot of them as we've continued. So from Annette earlier, so why do scientists, and I know we've talked about number, but I don't know, maybe you can explain it again in a little bit differently. Why do scientists now think the number of galaxies is around 200 billion instead of 2 trillion? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> Actually, that's a really good question. So part of the idea is that when you took the Hubble deep fields, um, you know that you can't see everything because there are fainter galaxies out there. So how do you make an estimate for that? How do you make an estimate for what you don't see? Well, what they use, it's kind of like, um, basically they're looking at the background light in the image, right? So there's a, uh, there, there's a bit of background haze in the image, right? So the question is, is, is that just sort of light uh, that that vague haze is that light from galaxies that are too far away. So they kind of made an estimate based on that. The problem you have with that is that there are other there are multiple things that make up that light. You know, one of the things is we have uh, we have a very bright star near us, the sun, and it's a good thing. I like the sun. It's a good, great thing it's here. We're very lucky it's here. Uh, but the thing is, if anybody's ever gone out, especially right near the equinoxes, so in the spring and the fall. Uh, and you've gone out right at night and you kind of see there's like a bright spot in the sky. It almost looks like a little triangular or like a little pillar. Uh, there's like a, a little brightness in the sky. If you go somewhere dark, that's called the zodiological light. 
What that is, is that basically is there's a lot of dust in the solar system. And basically the sun, that's when the sun first goes down, you see it reflecting off the dust. And so you kind of see on the other side of, from where the sun is, you kind of see the, this pillar of light. Uh, so there's that. And the problem is there, that dust is everywhere in the solar system. So you get a little bit of that light, diffuse light. Uh, so you have to kind of subtract that out and make some other guesses, but it's very much guesswork. Um, so uh, if you if you did the multiplication, I talked about like 124 millionth or 126 millionth of the sky. If you do the multiplication, you come up with that number around 200 billion. Uh, but if you if you look at some of the background, it seems like there's a lot more. Now, recently we had the New Horizons probe that went to Pluto. It's one of the fastest probes we've ever launched. It's racing, it's, it's much farther out than Pluto now and is racing out in the Kuiper belt. So it's much farther away from all that dust. So they actually used the camera to take some pictures of what looked like empty space to try to judge what that background light is. And so that new numbers are coming in much lower. And so they say maybe closer to 200 billion instead of 2 trillion. But those are only two data points. And I suspect you'll see it move between in that range some more. So that's actually a great question. Thank you. And that's, a, you know, another, you know, a fun generalization of science, right? Is that it's always changing as we learn more. So. Absolutely. It, that's that's right. the nature that's, of science, the fun part of science. That's right. Thank you. Okay. So um, Renee wanted to know where is the center of an irregular galaxy? If it's not a spiral, you know, if it's not a spiral shape where you would imagine a middle is, does an irregular shaped one have a center with the black hole in the it does have a center with a black hole, but it could be anywhere depending on how how much damage has been done to the galaxy. There's there's some small, for example, there's some small satellite galaxies uh, around the Milky Way, our galaxy, that are basically being completely ripped apart. And so it could be anywhere depending on what happened. If there's going to be a black hole, uh, whether it gets thrown out into space or whether it just ends up near the edge or uh, all kinds of things can happen depending on the interaction. So. Okay, thank you. And then Praneeth wants to know, can there be several small galaxies in a Milky Way? Or can there be several? Well, there are, so that's, so yeah, I think that's also a good question. There are several, we have a lot of sm smaller satellite galaxies orbiting us. And eventually what happens is the Milky Way will basically consume them and they'll become part of the Milky Way. That's cool. So that's one reason our galaxy is so big um, is that you, a lot of these galaxies grow over time because they, they merge. So yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. We, a, a lot of the stars in our galaxy probably have come from other galaxies that eventually th that have merged into the Milky Way. Thank you. And then that leads nicely into our next question from Ala. Are there places where some galaxies are somewhat clustered or are the galaxies somewhat evenly spread out? Yeah, that's a great question. There, Galaxies do cluster together. If you look at the, the, the larger picture of the universe, uh, the large scale, there is like some large scale structure. They tend to cluster into like these filaments. In fact, it looks kind of like a sponge. If you've ever seen these images, and unfortunately I don't have one in this pre presentation, but it kind of looks like a sponge. There are areas where there are no galaxies, they call them voids, and there are, they kind of cluster in these filaments called walls. And so there's like this large scale foamy structure to the universe. So that's actually a really good question. Great, thank you. And then another one, do we know at what point in the universe that it all started? That's what Carl would like to know. Well, that's that's actually a great question. And it's tricky because, because space itself expands, it's basically started everywhere. All of space and time were wrapped into a single point and then expanded out. So there's really no center. It's a common it, 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 it's it, it's a common question I get in a lot of my classes, and it's also very it's it's very hard to kind of imagine because it's very counterintuitive because we think of space as being just space right, but all the space is wrapped into one point. So you could say there was either no center, or that uh, everywhere was the center. So that's cool. I haven't heard that answer before. Um, okay, let's see. Two more questions. So we have a question about. I think you'll answer this too. Does the Hubble have an expiration date? So you can, we're going to talk about that in a minute, right? About what's coming next. Yeah, let's talk about what's coming next, and then we'll uh, then we can. So, uh, you know what what's coming next? Of course, is to see more and fainter objects. You need a better telescope, and 
and imaging technology has moved pretty far. Remember, to help, to, the Hubble went up in 1990. So, uh, you know, <laughs> that's, a, that's a long time ago in terms of digital technology. Um, so we're, we're, we're talking about the James Webb Space Telescope. And the thing about James Webb is it's got much better infrared capability because we know we'll be looking at these fainter objects, which you're seeing in the infrared. This is kind of a picture of the staff. Um, near a model of the James Webb. It's kind of exciting. The James Webb is actually scheduled to launch on October 31st of this year. So uh, it's been a lot of years in the making. So when you look at the difference between uh, the mirrors, right? Look at the different size of the Hubble and the James Webb Space Telescope. It's a much larger telescope. So it's got a lot more light collecting area, makes it more efficient, but also the detector technology, the camera technology is much, much better because it's much, much newer. So also, let me be a little bit different in terms of orbit. The James Webb Space Telescope, it, it, it's not really like Hubble 2. Uh, Hubble, you know, orbits about 570 kilometers up. In fact, there are websites you can look at that'll tell you uh, when you can see Hubble as a small dot going through the sky, right? So it's only, it's not that far up. Uh, it, so just for comparison, 570 kilometers, the, the moon is 384,000 kilometers away. So uh, Hubble's in a very close orbit to Earth. The James Webb won't be like that. It will be located one and a half million kilometers away. So, uh, you know, basically almost five times as far as the moon. Um, so it's going to be much, much farther away. So we won't be sending any astronauts there uh, to uh, service the James Webb. It has to kind of work on its own. It's at this point called L2. And what is L2? Well, it turns out in any in any system, gravitational system uh, with two bodies, there are like five points that are like, are, are gravitationally stable. There are like, there's like two of them are L4 and L2 and they're called L points for Lagrange who is the math, math 17th century mathematician who uh, basically who's math this is all based on. Uh, these are very super stable points. In fact, this is why we, we you hear about uh, asteroids following Earth and trailing Earth. And these are because asteroids get stuck in these points. And once they're stuck in the points, they tend to, if anything tries to move them out, they tend to fall back in in these points. There are also some semi-stable points, these L1, L1 through L3. And these are semi-stable. What you can do is they, they work very well to orbit around. And that's what James Webb is going to do. So it's basically going to orbit around L2, again, one and a half million kilometers from Earth. The other, th other thing about it is it's a really, because it's doing all this infrared, it needs to be very cold. So it's going to have a hot side and a cold side. A lot of people think space is really cold, and that's it, there is an absence of heat in space. But the thing is, you've got the sun in, sun in space, and the sun is very hot. In fact, astronauts, for the most part, the challenge is keeping them when they do spacewalks uh, or they're walking on the face of the moon, uh, you, you have to keep them cold, um, cool, not hot. So uh, basically, uh, there's a hot side that will basically has the, the solar panels and will protect it, and there's a very cold side. What we expect to see is we're hoping uh, we get some really good images. So here's a simulation of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field and one of the galaxies. And then here's what we expect to see in the James Webb Space Telescope. So first of all, you can see a lot more detail in that galaxy, structure in the galaxy. But you also see a lot of other things, a lot of faint things that you don't see in the Ultra Deep Field. Again, this is a simulation. We have to try it for sure to know what we get. Here's here's some here's some more uh, uh, details in terms of some more simulations. So again, the upper is the Hubble, and then especially when you go into the near infrared, if you look at the Hubble, uh, this is the visible light where the Hubble is pretty good. James Webb will be better, but the Hubble has some infrared capability, but it's not nearly as good as what you're going to have in the James Webb. And so we're hoping to get all the way pretty far back to uh, less than 200 million years. So uh, that's that's the end of the formal presentation. Do we have any more questions? Yes, I'm gonna go back to my question document here. Let's say we had just one more when we continued from Marianne and Tom, do gravity waves affect what Hubble sees? 
So gravity waves don't affect what Hubble sees. Um, the thing about gravity, that's that's actually another very good question. We had some really good questions today. We really did. Um, <laughs> gravity waves uh, basically, uh, th they're like a different way to look at the universe. So, you, you know, there was, there's several important, you know, like breakthroughs in observing the universe. You know, one of the, one of them was, uh, you know, when we first had telescopes and we could look at light and we could use spectroscopes, to get light. And then we, then we were able to, uh, you know, we started looking at it in other wavelengths, right. You know, like, uh, the, the light you can't see from earth, like X-rays and gamma rays and all that. The gravitational waves are another way of looking at the universe that's separate uh, because they aren't, they aren't light. So uh, it's, it's, it, it, they're very hard to detect, but uh, at the same time, they give you a much, they give you a view of things you can't see with regular light. Let me give you an example of how small they are. Uh, the gravitational waves and why it is so tricky to detect them are about 10 to the minus 21 meters, okay? Large and small numbers are hard, right? Because they just become numbers after a point, right? 10 to the minus 21. Well, how small is that? Well, you start talking about um, like the size of a virus is like 10 to the minus ninth meters. So you got to get a lot smaller. And if you start talking about um, like uh, the size of an atom is like 10 to the minus 15th meters. Uh, you start talking about, well, okay, let's get even smaller. What the nucleus of that is about 10 to the 18th minus 18th. Um, and so you're basically smaller than the, the, the size of the gravitational waves that we're detecting are basically smaller than a quark that makes up like a proton. So these little tiny subatomic particles, and you're trying to measure, they try to measure uh, something that displaces just a little tiny bit. So actually know that you couldn't even see it on a Hubble image uh, when you get the, the stretching of space and time. So it's actually very tricky to detect. That's, that's cool. Um, let's see. We did have some more questions coming in as we, as you were answering the other one. So, sure. let's see. so Tina would like to know why are these, why are there those stable orbiting points and how was that determined? So it, 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 it's because when you have uh, uh, two objects that have gravity and one is orbiting another, uh, when you kind of work out all the gravitational calculations, it turns out those that the, the, those are those stable points exist, right? Uh, it has to do with um, it has to do with the effects of gravity for both objects. Uh, you know, it's at points where they sort of balance, and uh, it, it's just it's just it's just a mathematical thing that 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 was worked out. That when you when you have two objects with a force, once you accept that gravity is a force, and you have that in two objects, you get these these stable points are going to develop. And then Joseph would like to know how many sessions of observing were needed to get the deep field images. Um, so the um, the original deep field was 342 exposures. I know I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure off the top of my head the uh, ultra deep field or the extreme deep field. Okay. Uh, but I will tell you that um, over that 23 days, I mean. So like uh, the 12 days on the ultra deep field took about three months to do. So uh, it's not all done in one sitting. Okay. Um, the, the original Hubble deep field took 10 days, even though it's only six or seven days of exposure. I'm not sure how long the extreme deep field took. That's a lot of orbits of earth. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking in many years, right? <laughs> uh, it, it, the, it takes, it takes quite, it, it, it takes a lot of time. Now they, they do, kind of split it up they may be doing other things as well but yes so when i talk about 23 days that's just the time the shutter was open that's the exposure time that's not the actual physical time it took to gather it so that's a great question okay and then a few more let's see um carl would like to know you showed a slide of the different spectrums which go well beyond infrared so are we planning no instruments or do we have instruments to see those waves and do they translate to images are these slides available <laughs> Oh, okay, so I think there's several questions there, right? Okay, um, are, are these slides available? Yes, sure. Uh, yeah. We can make those available. I'm not sure if you've got a, a website or something. I think we can, yeah. Um, so um, 
the uh, it, so yeah, so I mean, you know, James Webb is you know the next generation telescope is going to have instruments, more sensitive instruments, but it does visible as well as infrared. It just does not focus. It's not focused solely on infrared, right? So, uh, yes, we're going to con we continue to improve the instrument. There's another telescope coming out uh, on the planning board. It's called the Nancy Roman Space Telescope. And Nancy Roman uh, basically was uh, basically one of the project leaders for Hubble for many, many years. Uh, you know, so uh, that we'll also be able to do deep fields like this and and do extended extended imaging so the good news is the imaging technology keeps getting better so every year so just like your cell phone <laughs> that's, that's right <laughs> okay and then let's see um we can ask let's we'll ask two more just we have a few more minutes and i'm going to be changing my slide to to um have our closing slide do you, you need me to stop sharing i think if you stop sharing then i can share mine in a moment too that'd be fine okay and then um if you are if you are leaving you're about Thank you for coming. Adam included a chat for evaluation, a, a link in the chat for our evaluation. We'd love to get your feedback about Astronomy Days, but we are still gonna stay on for a few more minutes if you would like to hear some more um, discussion about some of the questions that we are receiving. So, yes, and thank you all for attending. Thank you very yeah, much for your attention. Thank you all for joining us. And again, we have a few more minutes and we are so thankful you could come to today's program. First way, great way to start off a Saturday morning, Ian. And we're again, very thankful to our sponsor, for the North Carolina Space Grant. So I'm gonna share my screen with our, our final slide. And then we, um, let's see if I, hopefully I can see the questions as they pop up. Okay, here we go. Here's my chat. Okay, sorry, that took me a little bit more than I was hoping. <laughs> okay, so would a galaxy look different if the picture is taken a million years from now? Which I... Well, uh... So basically, yes. yes. <laughs> uh, so, you know, basically, if, if you take if you're a million years from now, you're going to be getting light from ga these galaxies that is a million years, they're going to be a million years evolved, right? So, yes, they would look different. Galaxies are, it's actually pretty dynamic, uh, just like the galaxies that orbit the Milky Way and then, you know, the Milky Way is eating them up. And if you go out uh, like a couple of billion years from now, that the, the Andromeda galaxy, which is the other big galaxy in our group, it's the size of the Milky Way, and us will actually merge. The Milky Way will actually merge. So yes, it's constantly looking different. So yeah, if you waited a million years and took a picture, you would you would definitely see differences. And Bob would like to know, should NASA use Artemis to do James Webb servicing missions? Well, you know, yeah, the thing about it is uh, it, it's very deep space. Uh, and uh, it's really not set to do that. Probably what you'll end up with is it, if they do any kind of servicing, they might want to consider doing it robotically. Uh, but yeah, it would be very difficult to send people out that far. So uh, that's one reason that the, um, uh, they being so careful with the James Webb Space Telescope and it's, it's taken a number of delays is everything kind of has to work, right? It's not, not like Pubble where you have the space shuttle that can just go up there and you can, you can basically put a screwdriver to it, so. All right, well, I think, I think those are all of our questions. So you all had great questions today. We'd love to hear your questions and comments. And again, thank you so much, Ian, for spending a lot of your week with us and, and part of your Saturday morning with us. It was really fun to hear about galaxies and galaxy exploration. Uh, well, thank, thank you for inviting me and thanks everyone for their attention and uh, uh, and all the great questions. I love getting a lot of good questions. Yes, we love great questions. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thanks again.